Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to an open house before. Have you ever been to an open house? Have you ever had your house as an open house when you were trying to sell it? It's like, I think it's like a good idea, but it's like extremely weird. And what I mean by this is, 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 is what you do is you open your house up, usually on a Saturday for a few hours, and you say, anyone is welcome to come and, into my house. My bedroom, welcome. My bathroom, yeah, come take a look. It's like kind of weird. Because also sometimes for us, we like, you like park like maybe like a block away and you watch who goes in your house, right? Maybe, that, maybe you don't do that. Maybe you're not as creepy as that, but like maybe you do. And you like sit there like, oh, no, oh yeah, like uh, this would be awesome, right? It's like, it's kind of weird. Open houses. Now, they're also kind of cool because again, you get to have an opportunity to just kind of see, you know, what a space could look like if you were to kind of move into it. But it is a little bit of an odd thing. But I think in some ways, when you think about open house, I think as believers, really our hearts and our, even our homes, I believe should be open to welcoming in people for meals and welcoming in people for hospitality. I think as followers of Jesus, really, like, like our mission is to, similar to Jesus, to seek and save the lost, right? So Jesus saves them, we find them, and we bring them into our homes, and we share about Jesus. We should be open, even in our, in a, with our love, just loving people openly. And so I want to talk today about this concept, because our homes, if you know your home, it's it provides security and it provides safety. It provides shelter from the elements. It, and it's the spaces where some of our greatest memories happen is at our homes, at the dinner table, you know, in, in, in our child's room as we're reading stories and we're talking. Some of my greatest moments come from our homes. And if you've ever moved, moving can be pretty tough because you remember all of the moments that you had in a home. And I remember when I was a child, we moved and as soon as we moved, we got into the new house, I started crying. My mom's like, oh, I know, it's so tough. Like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, yeah, but how many, how many steps were on our stairs? That was, that was why I was crying. I didn't remember how many steps we had. Because I counted in the new home, there was 13 in the old home. I was like, I want to know. And I was just crying about how many steps there were. But I think this concept of really, how do we open up ourselves to be available how do we open up our spaces, our homes, whatever, to be available to people who need it? How do we open up our minds and our homes? So I want to share a message today I called Open House, but really the concept is I want to talk about the power of hospitality. You know, what is it? How do we become hospitable as people? How do we become more open with, with how we love and how we bring joy and how we share Jesus and welcoming people, maybe even to, into our physical homes? How do we do this? And I want to read um, the story of a man named Ananias and how his hospitality and love impacted the future of the church and really of the gospel entirely and really just the Bible. And you, re you first read about this man, Ananias, and, uh, in, in uh, Acts chapter 9. So I'm going to read the beginning of this. And this is when Saul has his moment of, 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 of encounter with, 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 with God, right, with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And we're going to be focusing really on the end part of the story. But so we're going to read this context. We kind of know where Ananias uh, has found himself. So in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says this. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats in every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. It's a great start to a story. It's like an epic start to a story, right? Like he's like, I'm about to kill all of the Lord's followers. That's a pretty bold and like aggressive way that he was, right? So we went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation to arrest any of the followers of the way he found there. And the way would be Jesus. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. That was his mission going to Damascus was, I'm going to capture followers of Jesus and we're going to bring them back in chains to where we are. And it says, as he was approaching Damascus on his mission, 
a light from heaven suddenly shone around, uh, shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. This is this powerful moment of an encounter on the road to Damascus, right? This powerful moment with this guy, he's on his way to Damascus. Why really? To just persecute and and take the followers and kill them and put them in chains. Like that was his entire mission. And God kind of meets him in this moment. And and it changes the course of really just the gospel. It really changes the course of the Bible as we know it, right? This moment is so important for us. You see, Paul, right, he has this incredible life-changing, life-altering, and life-giving encounter with Jesus on this road to Damascus. But the, the side effect is that he's blind, and he's hungry, and he's thirsty. And so many messages can come from this portion, and I don't, we're not going to go through this part of the story today, but it's incredible. And at some point, I'd love to go through this in more detail. But I want to spend the most of our time today on the second half of the story, because it's such a small part of scripture, but there's so much in it when it comes to how do we, how do we become more hospitable and how do we love? And so in verse 10, in Acts chapter nine, it says this, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. So what we're, this moment we're introduced to Ananias and some versions of, of scripture, they even call him a disciple, right? A follower of Jesus, a believer who, who's following Jesus. He's dedicated to the things being taught by Jesus. But the thing is, we don't get that much information about him. We don't know if he had a following. We don't know if he was popular. We don't know if he was high esteemed. We don't know much about him. But God chooses Ananias and he meets him and says, Ananias, all we know is that he's a follower of Jesus, I think sometimes those of us who are followers of Jesus, this is kind of where we find ourselves too. Why? Because we feel like we, we, we feel sometimes so insignificant. We feel like we're not making an impact. We feel like there's nothing going on. And what we're doing is we feel like we're just waiting for God to speak. We're waiting for the next mission. We're waiting for him to call us to the next thing. And we feel like we've been waiting forever. You ever feel like you're waiting for God to tell you what to do? And you're like, God, just tell me because I'm, I'm getting frustrated. I don't know what to do. You ever feel that way? I feel that way so often. I'm like, God, like, can you just give me the map? Can you plug it into my Google Maps and tell me where I'm supposed to go? And we're waiting and waiting and we feel like we're not making an impact. And we don't know much about Ananias, but he's in his home. He's sitting there and all of a sudden, boom, the Lord shows up and calls him by name. Because God has a knack of meeting us in sometimes the most unexpected ways. He says, Ananias. And then Ananias says two of the most powerful and dangerous words, really, that we can say. He says, yes, Lord. Right? It's almost, it's kind of like an echo of what Isaiah said. Here I am, send me, right? So when God speaks to us, how do you respond? Do you say, yes, Lord, I'm available, I'm willing, I'm ready to go? Or do you say, God, I, I don't get off till five. But God, I got to sleep in this morning. It's my, it's my one sleeping day. It's Saturday. I got to mow the lawn. Or do you say, yes, Lord, whatever you say, I will do. If we want to become more hospitable, the main thing is we have to say, yes, Lord, I'm available. When someone is struggling, when someone needs a place to go for a meal on Christmas, are we willing to open up our homes and open up our traditions to welcome somebody else in? Yes, Lord. If you want to discover your calling in life, if you want to discover the next steps and where God is leading you, this is how you start. You open up and you say, I'm going to open up all that I am and say, I'm available, I'm willing, and I'll do whatever it takes to follow your voice. Yes, Lord. He says, I'm available. 
That's how you discover your calling. If we continue in verse 11, then he gets the mission. And the mission's tough. Like the mission is not one that like everyone was like chomping at the bit to do. It says this, the Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. And when you get there, ask for a man named Tarsus, named Paul. He's praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias. He's like, that's you, bro. You're Ananias. Remember I said Ananias, that's you. I showed him a vision of you. And he's coming. He's going to come. He's going to lay hands on you. Uh-uh, you're going to lay hands on him. So this is the mission, right? Almost like the mission should you choose to accept it, right? Like, are you going to take it? <laughs> Ananias. Now, this, this is me to a T. But Lord, I don't want to do that. Right? Like, but Lord, like, no. He says he exclaimed it, right? Like, you ever exclaimed, but God, that's tough. That, that guy's mean. He hurt my friend, right? Like, but Lord. And then he starts to explain to God the situation. Like, okay, check this out. I've heard many people talk about the terrible things that this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon his name. That guy? <laughs> I don't know. Again, you've probably done this because I've done this. I've had a moment where I'm like, yes, God, I'll go wherever you send me. And he's like, go here. And you're like, no. <laughs> Absolutely, I will not. Jonah went the other way. Like, he's like, peace out. I'm out of here. Then he gets swallowed by a fish. Like, like, like it's better to follow the first time. But Lord... Do you know this man? Let me tell you about Saul. That dude is dangerous. I've heard the stories. Isn't that the same guy that, that held the coats while, while our brother Stephen was stoned to death? Is that the same guy? And then he says to God, sir, this is a death sentence. You're asking me to die. I think you're asking me to go for the wrong guy. There's got to be someone more educated. There's got to be someone who's been following you longer. There's got to be somebody else. Send me somewhere else. I will cook a turkey for the poor, but I'm not going to that guy. I'm not going. What if, can I just go pray for the sick or can I just go, just go hang out and play chess with someone? Can I do that? What if I just go preach a good message and memorize more scripture? What if? What you want me to do is going to be hard. Just because God calls you to something doesn't mean it's going to be easy, right? I think sometimes we, God's like, do this. You're like, um, that wasn't like not the plan though, right? You want me to go find a guy that's been killing and imprisoning my brothers and sisters? That guy? And then he goes, your thoughts, God. What, what's your opinion on this? Right. The Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. I never really realized this before, but he says this. Paul inflicted so much suffering on the followers of Jesus but Paul also probably received a lot more too. If you know the life of Paul, he, he went through a lot. Imprisoned and shipwrecked, shipwrecked, like so many things. So many tough things. And he says, Paul, what's your mission? Really? I'm going to show you how much you're going to suffer for me. Now imagine that's the message you're going to go tell Paul. Saul, right? Like, you know, you get a prophetic word for someone. It's like, yeah, that's tough. You're, you're going to suffer for, for his name's sake. Good luck, right? Like, that's the message he has. But really, this part right here, I want to read it again. Saul is my chosen instrument. The man who, yes, he's been imprisoning and, and taking the lives of believers. I'm choosing him to bring my message further than it could ever go. This is the way of Jesus, right? The way of love above comfort and the way of hospitality above grudges and the way of forgiveness over bitterness. As followers of Jesus, we choose the way. Or even they talk about that in that verse, right? Like, I'm going to find those who follow the way, and we're going to take them back in chains. 
And then what's so interesting is there's so much persecution for something that is so deeply founded in love that the world doesn't like it. The way of Jesus is a way where a criminal can become a friend or your enemy can become your ally. This is the good news of Jesus is that you've never far, gone far too, uh, you're never far too gone. You've never done too much. Jesus wants to meet you wherever you are and whenever you are. Even if you're on the road to Damascus, on your way to persecute people, even if you're on your way to do something you know you're not supposed to do, Jesus can meet you there in that moment. Jesus wants to meet you. Because what's beautiful is God calls us to be, you and I to be a part of his story, to bring the good news, to seek and save the lost. You know, we don't get to decide on who's worth saving and who's not. We don't get to decide who's worthy and who's not. But I think sometimes we do that. We're like, I'm not going to talk to them because they're not worthy of it. It's like, neither are you. Neither am I. Worthy of his love and worthy of who all that he is. Only he decides. And our mission, our job is to go and share Jesus and welcome people into our lives and love them and take care of them and be generous with them. He calls us to bring the good news. You might not understand how important the assignment is. It might seem so small. It might seem so insignificant. We might feel like, God, like really this? Like it doesn't even seem like a big deal. Like it's so small. It might even seem scary. It might seem weird. But he says, this is how I want to do it. And so we say yes to him. He says, I'm going to go and seek and save the lost. He's like, yo, come for the journey. Come be a part of it with me. And in verse 17, right after God says, go, what does is, what is Ananias do? He says, so Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized immediately. It says, afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. And Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. You know, like, I can imagine staying with the believers in Damascus for a few, day, a few days. Now, maybe they had heard word that Saul was on his way, right? Like, messengers like, yo, Saul's coming. Be careful. And then all of a sudden, Saul shows up to your house. He can't see. And he's like, I'm waiting here for Ananias. And then now you're eating meals together for three days. You'd be like, are you trying to trick me, right? Like, are you trying to swindle? You know, like, like what are you doing? Are you trying to like, like, what are you doing? That's how I would probably respond. If my enemy just showed up, he's like, hey, I'm coming over for supper tonight. I'm waiting for my friend. He's coming over too. I'd be like, probably not. Not safe. But this is how this moment happened. And the thing I think we all have to understand is that all of us, when you might not be called to be Paul. You might not be called to be Saul. But I believe that all of us can be called and do the same thing that Ananias did. What? Be available and willing and go where no one else is willing to go, even if it's hard, even if it's challenging, and love somebody no matter what. I believe we can all be called to do that. We might not end up being having the platform. We might not be the one writing half of the New Testament. We might not be the one that, that, that's popular, but we can do the things in secret that God sees and he says, well done. We can do the things that most of us, that most people might not even be willing to go. See, Ananias, he's not mentioned in scripture much after this. Like he's not like he's like has his own book, right? This is his one moment of fame, right? Like, I don't want to go. I'm going to go anyway, and I might die. And then all of a sudden, this beautiful moments happen. We might not be called to be Saul. We might not be called to be Paul, but we can be called to do the same thing that Ananias did. See, I think some of us, we feel less than because we feel like our gifts are different. We feel like we, like, we, we, feel like we, we want to be seen with the things that we do are so like under the surface and people don't notice the things that we're doing. We might not have, again, the platform. We might not have the stage, but we feel like, God, like, like I want someone to notice what I'm doing. I want someone to see what it is that I am doing. 
Sorry, I'm distracted because my baby is screaming at the back of the room. <laughs> and that's like weird as a parent. You're like, should I go? You know, and then anyway, it's like, see ya. Yeah. Sorry, now nah, I'll get back on track. <clears throat> this is what it says in Matthew 6, verse 1 to 4. It says, watch out. Don't do your deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets. Now I can imagine, because you see this. We might not be blowing trumpets, but we're out here with our cell phones filming our good deeds and putting it all over social media. It's like, look what I did. I fed this guy. What are you going to do? We might not blow trumpets, but we talk about it. And we post it on social media. Look how helpful I am. in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. See the reward from our gift, the reward from our generosity, the reward from our hospitality is not to be noticed, it's not to get attention. I don't think Ananias was like, this is my moment to make it into the book that Dr. Luke is writing. This is my moment. I don't think he even had that concept in his mind, right? No one might not, most people might not even understand the sacrifice that you've made. They might not even, maybe even see some of the things that you're doing. But that's the way it's supposed to be. No act of service is too small. No amount of hospitality or generosity is too small. It's not too small. There's so many things that even happen here at our trips that get so unnoticed. They just happen. It's like we happen to have clean bathrooms all the time. That's because of hair. Does a great job making sure our church is clean. So many things that happen that go unnoticed. Like you remember last week, it was pouring rain on Father's Day. And we had two people outside cooking bacon. It's amazing. We had, we, we, like, it's incredible the things that happen. And it, the, the, I just want to say thank you. I'm not, we're not preaching this message to say do a better job. I'm saying thank you for being hospitable. Thank you for loving. Thank you for loving my family. And thank you for welcoming us in. And thank you. Because I think we all need people in our lives to, to, that will be hospitable with us, that will love us and take care of us when we're struggling and when things are hard and cook bacon when it's pouring rain. And I heard the bacon was good. I had a little piece. I don't really eat bacon, but I had a piece and it tasted good. Thank you. You know, I was in Bible school. I was in Los Angeles. And this kind of, we were doing this like worship night and this guy was kind of like speaking, you know, prophetic words over people. And now he came to me to give me my word, right? And I was like, ah, let's go, right? It's like, I'm like, give me the stage, right? Give me the following. Give me the fame. Give me the money, right? That's me. Guy's like, your gift? I see the spiritual gift of hospitality in you. I was like, now, I did that, like, in my spirit, okay? Like, I wasn't like, you know, like, what do you mean, right? Like, I didn't do that. I was like, like, tell me I'm a leader, you know? Tell me I'm going to make a difference. Tell me I'm going to make a huge global impact. You have the gift of hospitality. I see that God has placed the spiritual gift of hospitality on your life. Now, I didn't know this, but years prior, my mom was, you know, young. She was in church. And she was feeling like, I don't know if I have any sort of gift. Like, I don't, you know, like, you have a moment where you're like, what's my gift? Like, like, do I have something inside of me? And this pastor came up and he preached this message on the spiritual gift of hospitality. And he clicked for a moment and said, that's me. I have that. If you know my mom, like, she's the most hospitable person I've ever met. Like, incredible. And at that time, I didn't really realize that hospitality was a spiritual gift. I didn't, I didn't like, fully understand it. I thought it was just, you know, like, you know something good you know like go to the hotel or the hospital hospitality right like but the gift of hospitality really hospitality is defined 
as the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. Friendly and generous. You know, being friendly doesn't cost you a thing. Just your smile. That's it. You might be like, yeah, bad teeth. It's like, so what? Some of the happiest smiles I've ever seen are with less teeth. Think about a toddler smiling at you. You're like, it's the cutest smile I've ever seen, right? Being friendly doesn't cost anything. (laughs) But you know what I've realized? There's a lot of unfriendly people in the world. And sometimes it's me. How do we become more friendly? How do we become more generous? I believe the followers of Jesus should be the most friendly people on the planet. That even if I don't get the right meal at the restaurant, I'm not going to throw the table and say, I'm never coming back here. That's extreme, okay. I've never done that. And I had no plan to. I just like, this was my moment to shine, right? Even if we don't get our way, even when our kids don't listen, it happens a lot. I believe we should be the most friendly people on the planet as followers of Jesus and the most generous people. This is hospitality. This is how Peter wrote about it in 1 Peter. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. That's very, we hear that verse so much. But verse 9 says, cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Cheerfully. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. In the NIV version, this is what it says. It says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And verse nine, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You know, we're supposed to be hospitable. Not out of obligation, not, but out of opportunity to love and share Jesus. We all have the ability to serve. You know, I, again, I doubt Ananias thought, wow, this is my moment to get into the book. Woohoo, right? My name will go down in history. If you remember earlier in Acts, there's a guy named Ananias who got, went down in history for the wrong reasons. And not good. I think... For him, it wasn't about fame. It was about being obedient. Like it, it wasn't about like even making a difference really. Like I think for him, it was like, I'm just going to do what God has called me to do and see what happens. Listening and listening for and listening to the voice of God, which are two different things, right? Listening for it and listening to it are very different things. And then being obedient to what he's speaking. You know, we're not serving, we're not being hospitable to be noticed. We do this because we're followers of Jesus. The one who sacrificed everything for me, who was hospitable to me, even though I didn't deserve it, he gave his life for me. You know, Mother Teresa, she has this quote, and this is our takeaway today as well, Mother Teresa. If you don't know Mother Teresa, Google her. Incredible woman. But it says this. Not all of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. If you want to do something great, it's less about the things you do and it's about how great your love is for one another. Whatever you do and however you serve, let great love be what people remember about you. Great love, not the great things you did. It's more about the love than the things. It's more about trying hospitality and love than anything else. He yeah, Ananias was obedient. And what happened is he welcomed him into his home and they had a meal and they baptized him. He was a part of Paul's restoration story. A gift that I think Paul remembered for the rest of his days. In fact, later on in Acts, you see Paul have a recollection of Ananias. And he says, this man came to me and he laid hands on me. I think it's Acts uh, chapter 22, I believe. But he had an important role in Paul's story. But again, he's, he's in this scripture for like 18 verses. Not even, like 10 verses we hear about this guy. And we don't really talk about him that often. But it's so important what he did. Let us learn to be hospitable. Let's be friendly and let's be generous without grumbling. Because life is too short 
for hate and life is too short to hold on to grudges and life is too short to think that people can't change. You never fully know the impact of a moment will have on someone. It might seem small, it might seem insignificant, but it actually could change somebody's life. Something so small. Let's do it with great love. Let's open up our hearts and open up our arms to those who are in need and open up ourselves to serve and be hospitable. And you know what this is gonna do? It's gonna leave you vulnerable. But the vulnerability speaks volumes to those who are in need. This is the call. This is the way of Jesus. Be hospitable. When God calls, we go. Even if we're unsure the outcome, we need to be obedient. So I want to encourage us all. Let's learn to be hospitable. Let's learn to welcome each other into our lives and into our homes and and have meals together. This is so important for connection and so important for relationship. We can spend time and be together and love each other and take care of each other. That even if one of us strays away, that we're willing to fight for each other. So I want to pray for us when it comes to hospitality. And you know, the guy said, hey, you have the gift of hospitality. And sometimes I'm like, I don't see it a lot. Right? I'm learning to be more hospitable. So let's just pray. God, I thank you um, that, that we can learn from you. We can learn from even just the stories in Scripture that there's so much value in them and so much beauty in them. So God, I pray that you help us learn to be more hospitable. You help us learn um, to, to be hospitable without grumbling, to be hospitable not out of obligation, but opportunities. God, help us be known for how hospitable we are and how much we love and take care of each other. As well as God, let us, let us welcome up, welcome people that might not even be friends, they might be enemies or strangers. Welcome them in and love them the same way that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.